Well, I'm not going to talk about sexuality today, so I'm going to go a different direction. Our text is going to be in 1 Kings 2011. I don't know how you do it here, but where I do it, we stand for the reading of the Word of God, so if you'd please stand. <clears throat> then Ahab, the king of Israel, replied, tell him, let not him who girds on his armor boast like him who takes it off. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, let's pray. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Please use this time and imperfect words to build up these young men and women for your glory and their good. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You be seated. Well, I'm not going to lie. I think it's quite funny that a guy who barely made it out of public school with a GPA of 1.8 I had to look that up and see what that is. That's, uh, that's a C, right? Um, it's speaking to the student body of New St. Andrews. Look at all of you. Wow. I wish my public high school teacher, a high school guidance counselor, could, could see this. My junior year, she tried to bully me into taking French. I'd already taken Spanish. I, I, I got an A one semester and a B and then a C and then C's and I was done. Right? It was getting worse because it was getting harder and I wasn't good at it. Uh, and she's like, you got to take another, another language class if you want to do well in college. And I, I didn't want to do well in college. I didn't want to go to college. It wasn't something I was thinking about. Um, I was a, a, a do the bare minimum sort of guy at that stage in my life. I think I was just converted around that time. Nonetheless, she kept pushing me harder and harder and I kept refusing. And she got very frustrated, and she, she really said this. She's very ang angry. She said, Michael, you're never going to amount to anything in life. Right? She said that. That's what my guidance counselor said. And I told her, you know, that may be, but you know one thing? She said, what's that? I said, no matter what happens to me, I know one thing. At least I won't be a high school guidance counselor. <laughs> and here I am presenting at New St. Andrew's Macchiato. Dispotato? <laughs> Why is this thing named after a Starbucks drink? What's going, what's going on? Oh, oh, it's Latin. I see. Okay. Well, I told the folks on Facebook that I was speaking to you guys, and I, I asked them, I said, what should I speak on, but only wrong answers. Right, I only want wrong answers. So I got like 170 replies. Uh, would you like to hear just a few of them, yeah? yeah. All right, good. All right, so uh, first, how to rightly discern your Enneagram. So <laughs> are you eight, seven? Uh, people ask me for Enneagram, I tell them I'm a Pisces. Um, <clears throat> how watching anime gives you autism. Have fun <laughs> editing that out. Should we continue and cringe so that based may abound? <laughs> Why loving your neighbor means doing anything the government says. This is one of my, this is one of my favorites. Slay the girl, get the dragon. <laughs> this next one's lowbrow, but bear with me. Doug Wilson is a poo-poo head and sweater vests are stupid. My wife, Emily, she knows uh, that there are few things like essential oils that I despise. I despise essential oils more than anything, in particular lavender. But she said, uh, she said, the secret connection between Masanto and essential oils. And that's my dream, that Masanto is behind the whole thing. It would be great. So what, what does this talk about? It's about insults. To be precise, it's about the blessing of a good insult. I love insults. I grew up on your mama jokes. Your mama jokes were a rite of passage in the 90s, especially when you're the only white kid in a not white school. You gotta learn to, you know, quip, your mama's so hairy that Bigfoot takes pictures of her. That stuff <laughs> has to roll off the tongue if you're gonna survive. Um, and I, I don't like just, you know, giving insults. I like receiving a good insult. I spoke at this men's conference it's like a really big deal, millions of views and all this stuff. And there's this gay pastor, like as in a sodomite, like actually gay, um, that got booted from the PCA who hopped on the video stream or the comment 
And, and he, he took aim at me over my clothing. And I was dressed a little more formal, my apologies. Uh, but he said, uh, what's the deal with his clothing? Did two different people dress him? <laughs> I love that. That made me like that. I still blocked him. I mean, come on. But uh, I mean, but yeah, it made me like him a little bit. I thought, yeah, there's something to that. My favorite insulter in church history is none other than Martin Luther. You know that. He, uh, he would have been amazing on Twitter before the censorship, right? I mean, his, his insults are like YouTube comet intense, right? Um, you people are more stupid than a block of wood. All right, you know, that's not that good. For you are an excellent person, a skillful, clever, and versed in holy scriptures as a cow in a walnut tree or a sow in a harp. <laughs> I like this one. It's what do you call it? A Parapodoskian, I think. Uh, you seem to me to be a real masterpiece of the devil's art. <laughs> That's good stuff. My favorite insult in scripture is the text I read at the beginning of this, found in 1 Kings 2011. Basically, the context of this verse is two kings, Ben Hadad and the inf uh, infamously uh, ungodly Ahab. And they're taunting each other as you do before a fight, as you do before a war. And again, it reads, then Ahab, the king of Israel, replied, tell him, let not him who girds on his armor boast like him who takes it off. So prior to battle back then, uh, you would uh, harness and gird your armor to yourself. And then you'd go out and fight. And then you'd come back and you'd take it off. So Ahab essentially is saying it's easy to talk big outside the ring. But let's see what happens when you step inside the ropes, right? That's what he's saying. In other words, you ain't done nothing yet. It's easy to have big talk. Now, how is this insult of a wayward, idol-worshiping king valuable wisdom and instruction for us and you in particular? Well, first, let's agree that you can mine wisdom from the dark caves of pagan minds. Paul quoted the pagan poets, Calvin, Cicero, and I've learned quite a bit from Jocko Willink. Uh, Spurgeon, he puts it this way. On a dunghill, a diamond sometimes has been picked up, and it's not to be rejected because of the place where it lay. Such should be our general attitude. Proceed with caution, but do proceed. So why is this valuable wisdom for you, young men and women of NSA? Well, I can't improve really on Spurgeon, so I'm going to quote him again. He says, this text is particularly adapted to those who are commencing the battle of the Christian life. It would, also, it would do also for young men and women who are commencing life for themselves, lately married, beginning housekeeping, and intending to do so well, opening the new shop with such fair prospects, moving to a new farm with such bright hopes. It may be a word in season to such, girding on the harness. You have not put it off yet, and therefore do not boast. It will do uh, for my new students who have come to college. May they pres uh, preserve, be preserved from the tendency to boast, which is natural enough, and it is as silly as it is natural. Perhaps I address some young minister who's commencing his ministry, or some worker for Christ who's begun in the Sabbath school, or taken a district for distributing tack, uh, tracts, or entered upon some new labor. There may be other things which I need not mention here, but which each one can think of for himself, more especially if he happens to be in the condition intended. Let not him who girdeth on his harness boast himself as if that he put it off. So this insult is a good warning for you. Young people can be proud, especially when they know Latin and they attend an academically rigorous college such as this one. And make no mistake, it's a good thing to know Latin and to labor under rigor if you possess humility. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Thus an insult can be helpful if it deflates, that is, if it humbles an inflated proud spirit. The best digs, the best insults, are those which accentuate something true about the object of the insult. When that guy was making fun of my clothing, I had tried to look good. Right? And it did not work out. <laughs> Kids, one benefit of public school, there's not many, but one benefit is uh, kids, fine. They have like a, a ability in public school, probably private, I can't speak to it, you know. 
um, but to find the one thing that you're insecure about and just beat on it, right? You know, if you're fat, and they're going to talk about that. If you're skinny, they're going to make fun of you for being skinny. Like, it doesn't matter. If you're handsome, they're going to, like, make fun of you for being handsome. They really will. What's up, pretty boy? Right? You're modeling, right? So you're just going to make fun of people. And uh, sometimes... Uh, so they always like speak to something that's kind of true. This can be really hard to, I think, for women in particular to understand because men, we like to insult each other. But men, we, when we insult each other, we don't really mean it. Just kind of like, kind of like when women compliment each other and don't really mean it. <laughs> there is a, um, a, a beautiful balance that's uh, complementarianism, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> something like that. But perhaps let's move away from the form of an insult for a moment and simply get to the substance of the matter, which is speaking hard things that most people are not keen to hear. Proverbs 27, 5 through 6. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. So these are on verses you hear Christians or even pastors quote very often, perhaps around this way you do. I think most Christians would be very pleased just to ignore them as they run counter the conventional thinking about godly speech. Godly speech is always about affirmation, right? All positives, warm and fuzzy. Fuzzy wuzzy was a God, right? However, these verses contain truths that are essential if you're going to strap on your armor and go hard at life. Matthew Henry, his exposition is good. It's good for us to be reproved and told our faults by our friends. If true love in the heart has but zeal and courage enough to show itself in dealing plainly with our friends and reproving them for what they say and do amiss, this is really better, not only than secret hatred, but than secret love, that love to our neighbors, which does not show itself in this good fruit, which compliments them in their sins to the prejudice of their souls. Faithful are the reproofs of a friend. Though for the present they are painful as wounds, it is a sign that our friends are faithful indeed. If in love to our souls, they will not suffer sin upon us, nor let us alone in it. The physician's care is to the cure of the patient's disease, not to please his palate. It is, a dang it is dangerous to be caressed and flattered by an enemy whose kisses are deceitful. We can take no pleasure in them because we can put no confidence in them. Joab's kiss and Judah's or Judas, uh, both were deceitful, and therefore we have need to stand upon our guard that we not be deluded by them. They are to be uh, deprecated. Some read it, the Lord deliver us from a enemy's kisses, from lying lips, and from a deceitful tongue. So Ahab, in a roundabout way, was a friend to Ben-Hadad. I've actually benefited a lot from the critiques of enemies. You can learn a lot from them. Because Ben-Hadad here, eventually did get his rear handed to him in battle. And his arrogance is what undid him. He wasn't ready, just as Ahab warned. And in that sense, that good insult was a blessing. He should have listened. And there is such a thing as mean-spirited, unkind, ungodly speech. And therefore, uh, some insults are, are truly sinful. Some hard words are just hard and wretched, really. But it's not the hard words that you need to be most concerned about. I think it's more the smooth and soft words. Smooth words are flattering words, and they go down easy and puff up the willing recipient of such words. There's an excellent phrase contained in a personal letter from John Calvin that he gave to his good friend, Farrell. Calvin had just received a letter from Geneva asking him to return to the pastorate, having been expelled just a few years earlier. This letter included the following sentences. Oh, marvelous spectacle. The stone which the builders rejected is become the headstone of the corner. Come then, my venerable father in Christ. The Lord has given you to us. All sigh for thee. Aww. Calvin wrote back to Farrell, and he described the letter as being full of nauseating flattery. It's a helpful phrase. Nauseating flattery. I like that. It's difficult for me to believe that the majority of Christians would find such a letter nauseating. Some might rise uh, eyebrow up in concern, but few would be nauseated by flattering. Uh, my favorite dictionary, 
uh, is the Webster's uh, 1828. It's a great dictionary. It defines nausea as to become squeamish, to feel uh, nausea, to turn away with disgust. Flattery should sicken us. However, we've been taught all our lives to cherish and employ the use of flattery in all our communications. We've embraced the mantra of Mary Poppins. Now, you guys are young, but like, yeah, you come from good families. So do you guys know what the mantra of Mary Poppins is? I'm just curious. Could someone say it? Okay, good, wonderful. <laughs> they will never know, um, but we know. This binds us together. So we have embraced that idea, not the teaching of scripture, consider just a few of the Bible verses on the wickedness of flattery. For such people are not serving our Lord, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Romans 16.1. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. 1 Thessalonians 2.5. Whoever flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his feet. Proverbs 29.5. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. Jude 1.16. He who rebukes a man will in the, end, or in the end gain more favor than he who has a flattering tongue. Proverbs 28.23. Flattery is always used by ungodly men to mask their true intentions. These men might appear to be kind, but they are setting a snare by feeding your pride. A student of Socrates, or as I like to call him, Socrates, wisely said, it is better to fall among crows than flatterers, for those devour only the dead, these the living. Plutarch, and he's written quite a bit on the topic of flattery, probably have read Plutarch's Lives, I would assume. Uh, so he writes a lot of his cuts, just wonderful one-liners. Here's a few. Flatterers, uh, flatter, flattery, excuse me, da, da, da. flatterers are immutable and constant, not his own man, but ever-changing to be the man he thinks will appeal to his victim. A flatterer praises indiscriminately and copies his object's vices rather than virtues. A flatterer is always seeking to please. Give a flatterer absurd advice and speak impertinently of his undertaking and he will agree with your disagreeable counsel. A flatterer appeals to the lower, not higher nature of his victim. Beware of the one who's too eager to seem a friend who works too hard at gaining your trust. The flatterer labors to please rather than profit you. A flatterer will seek to separate you from your true friends by speaking ill of them. They like to poison the well. They say good things to you, and anytime someone's giving you really helpful feedback, right, they'll, they'll try to turn you against that person. That's why you must steer far away from flatterers as far as you can. And I'd say there's three things we should ask God for. First, that he would train our hearts to be nauseated by the sugary venom that is flattery. Second, that he would remove flattery from our own lips. The straightforward, loving rebuke of a friend, though they may seem harsh at the time, will accomplish more than the sweet words of a flatterer. You are really doing someone a friend. I are uh, uh, doing them a service. My, uh, my pastor of liturgy at our church, um, during the core group meeting of our church plant, we're about 11 months old, he says to me, hey, you keep talking about like how people are coming after you online and stuff. That's weird. You should stop that. No one talks about that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, but it's part of my life, you know, and like trying to like create all these excuses in my head for why I didn't have to change. But yeah, it was. It was actually alienating people. They can't relate to that. And I'm, I'm up there to relate to people, to bring truth to bear on them. It was hard. It was hard. Uh, and then there was a sermon. He said I rambled too much. And uh, they didn't like that one either. Then I listened to it, which is hard enough to hear your own voice. Like, I'm so sick of my voice. I'm going to go home and not talk for like a month. Um, I'm just going to talk on Sundays and shake my head when my wife says something. But, um, but I was like, yeah, that story wasn't really connected. I just went off. It was a ramble. So he told me hard things, and it, it made me a better communicator. Thank God for him. Lastly, that he would bless us with a humble self-assessment of ourselves. Plutarch is my favorite quote from him. 
on flattery. The surest prophylactic against the evils of the flatterer is a just opinion of oneself that will reject as untruthful the flatterer's insinuations. Amen, right? It's good. Let me bring this home. Uh, you don't know yourself the way you think you do. You absolutely don't. Your self-assessment's wrong. It might be better than some. You might be growing in it, uh, but it isn't what you think it is. It can't be, right? It just takes time. It takes experience. It takes failure. It takes sanctification. It takes the corrections of a friend. It takes faithful friends who will wound your pride. And you're at the beginning of this vocation for most of you. So don't strap on your armor like him who takes it off. One of my concerns for you, specific to you, it would be the same I'd have with anyone that comes from a community like this one, is success by proxy. In other words, you are blessed with bold, risk-taking, godly leaders in this community. Pastors, professors, entrepreneurs, bold men doing great things. God is blessing their faith and boldness, and it definitely trickles down to you, and you should be thankful for it, and you should grow under that soil and fertilizer, but you ain't done nothing yet, right? You are still strapping your armor on here. You're still getting prepped. Their winning doesn't make you a winner yet. In Cincinnati, we have a football team. Some would say we have a football team. Uh, <laughs> I became a relatively conservative or consistent Sabbatarian, so I don't watch football anymore. I don't really know what's going on. Uh, but they're not good. I, I know they're not. There's just no chance of it. Maybe they are. Someone tell me, are the Bengals good? Anyone breaking the Sabbath? Anyone? No? Um, all right. Uh, <clears throat> anyhow, um, so in Cincinnati on Sunday, if the Bengals win on Monday, everyone's happy. And if they lose, which is quite often, everyone's sad. Now there's a sort of covenantal reality there that I identify with, okay, right? Like if your army wins, you win with them. And this is like an emaciated, reduced version of that. So I get that, um, but uh, no. No, no, the Bengals winning doesn't make you a winner, and the Bengals losing, thank goodness, does not make you a loser. <laughs> you actually have to fight your own battles. You, you gotta go out there and do it. You gotta take risk. Beware of, of having everything figured out in your head, right? You think, I, I, I boxed for a time, and I could hold my own in my pond. Um, and then I jumped from my pond to, let's say, a lake and uh, found that while I was tough by pond standards, by lake standards, I don't want to be retarded the rest of my life. <laughs> um, it's not in me, and that really hurt, and they're so quick. And that's what I learned, uh, that once I got up in there, like, this isn't for me. This is, I, I'm not what I think I am. And I needed people to, that. well, when there's pain associated with it, it's how you learn. And that's why hard words are painful, and it's how you learn from them. And so you, you need to take risks. It is absolutely okay to fail, to dive into sexuality for a moment. I have a lot of guys reach out to me. And I, I'm just going to assume that women are like this too. But they, they want step-by-step -step instructions for everything. Like, what's the proper way to go on a date? Well... Um, go out and have fun. That's the goal. Make sure she has a good time and, and do, don't do intense stuff. Don't do the coffee shop where you're like this close staring at each other, like talking about role. Like, that's intense for a first date. You know, it's really intense. And if I was a chick, that would, that would be a lot for me, you know, and <laughs> it would be a lot. So what's your views on kids? What's your beliefs on contraceptive? Well, I have to go get something out of my car, right? So, so, you know, have fun. So I'll tell them, have fun, and they'll say, well, what about this? Should, what sort of place should I take? And what time should I pick them up? And what day of the week? And, and then it's like crazy, right? Just like they want like an out, outline, like, like a syllabus on how to have a date or something. 
is very stressful to me. Um, I'm like, you're stressing me out, man. Um, you just ask them out, and they say, no, it's OK. Ask another one. Don't ask too many in a row, though, because <laughs> you don't want that stink on you, OK? <laughs> just chill for a while. <laughs> right, ladies? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, nervous laughter. My favorite <laughs> laughter. It's the best kind. It's OK to fail. That's how you learn. That's how you grow. That's why we have kind of different steps into maturity, where the risk goes up higher and higher. But you have to take risks, and you've got to get out there and do things. You've got to get into the battlefield. you got to build your own household. You know, uh, one more long quote. You can always tell when people meet you. I'm going to give you deep insight to speakers, okay? You can always tell when a pastor or someone didn't put a lot of prep time, the more quotes they have the less prep time they put into it. So, my fifth quote. Um, <laughs> that's a good one, though. Teddy Roosevelt. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actively in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who never know victory nor defeat. All right, you got to leave the nest. Strap your armor on and get out there, right? Do something. Don't be, have success by proxy. They're prepping you for spiritual war. They're prepping you for great things. Talk is cheap. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that it's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit that these things are accomplished and that your spirit works in us to conform us to the image of your son to make us like you. Oh, Lord, bless us with humility. May we not be proud. Keep us from thinking much of ourselves and little of you. God, I pray that you would keep us humble by the efforts of us going out there to do it, whether it's our our schoolwork and songs and music and entrepreneurship or whatever, Lord, that we would stay humble, God, and through that we would accomplish much for your glory and the good of our neighbor. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So Amen. Let's, let's, let's just go biography because you started with your GPA. Sure. Um, Is that allowed here? Uh, what? Is that allowed here? Can you have a 1.8? 1.8? Yeah, people have 1.8s. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> what changed? So what really changed, um, I would have failed. I, I got expelled my freshman year. Um, I, I actually have never failed a class my entire life. Not, I failed tests that made me fail. But I've never failed a subject like in final exams. I always passed all of them. Uh, I was proud. I didn't like what I, d I saw as uh, busy work. I didn't respect them. I thought it was a big deal. And then, um, then what happened is someone preached the gospel to me, and the Holy Spirit worked through it. I had no apologetic conversion. It was just the gospel working on my heart. Uh, that immediately broke me, and, uh, and I felt uh, shame, uh, shame on my attitude towards my teachers. And <clears throat> I had a habit of having very long, complicated pranks. Um, and I had everyone convinced that I, I didn't believe that we landed on the moon we have, okay, we have, we have telescopes, we can see the stuff. Um, we can see it from this flat earth that we're on. But, um, <clears throat> but, uh, but anyhow, I had them convinced, and they actually, I had been, a very, I had been very aggressive towards Christians. Um, the, in my community, a lot of rural communities are very evil. People tend to think of urban areas of, uh, with fornication and drugs, but that's, that's quite common in rural areas, and it was in my situation as well. And there's people that would attend church out of uh, mere tradition, 
and didn't know the Lord and were doing horrible things. Then I turn on Trinity Broadcast Network or something and see them begging Christians for money. And I was like, man, Christians are idiots. These guys are clearly in it just for cash. Um, and so I, I didn't like Christians and I loved to stump them. The, thankfully, the new atheists run around. This is prior to the internet becoming high speed. You still could get on websites, but I'd read guys like Carl Sagan or Arthur C. Clarke and a lot of those early atheistic philosophers. And so I was an atheist the majority of my life, really agnostic before it. Um, and then the gospel just opened my mind. Um, God, God changed me. And then I immediately started taking my studies more serious. Because, and it, was, it wasn't because I wanted to be great, but I recognized I was an ambassador for Jesus. Um, and that I uh, represented him to my teachers. And I wanted them to know that what had happened to me uh, was real, because it was. And so slowly but surely people realized it wasn't a joke. And, you know, we, everyone has those, you know, most likely to see it. I, I didn't get that one. Uh, but I did get most changed, and, and it was real. And, and so that's, that's what changed. And, it is, and, and it's been, um, the, the problem with uh, white trash people such as myself, um, whose hymnal is Guns and Roses growing up, uh, <clears throat> is that we have very low ambitions. Uh, we set very low, we're like uh, video games and something to drink and a couch is enough to get by. And, uh, and we're passive. And so to break free from that, if you read books like Hillbilly Elegy, it's probably very helpful on that topic. Uh, to break free from that uh, took Jesus and teaching me to go out, the creation mandate, to go build and do great things. And there's a corrective phase that follows you through life. You know, uh, I'm 41. I'm at where I probably should have been, you know, maybe five years ago. But when I was 30, I was where I should have been, you know, 10 years, right? So I'm closing the distance, and God, God does redeem us. He, he builds beautiful things from rubble. Yeah, fantastic. Um, in your talk, you start with the idea of insult. And I want you to differentiate two sort of potentially opposing things. Sure. Um, you talk about insult, and you talk about rebuke in almost the, it's the same way. Yeah. There's, there's a, dif there's, there is, there's there a is, difference. Yeah. Could, you, could you pass the difference out between insult and rebuke and the difference between genuine praise yep. and flattery? Uh, that's a great distinction. Those are a little hard to parse. Um, so... I mean, with the flatterer, if you, if, you, if you write it down, what he says on a piece of paper, and you take it from his mouth into a different mouth, it takes on different meaning, right? Because of intentions, the context, what they're trying to get from you. Uh, that's a little bit the same uh, with, with insults. Like, guys, a lot of times uh, when we insult each other, we're taking each other's measure. Uh, can you roll with this? Do you recognize that you're doing this? Like, hey... Uh, you're gonna be, you know, you be on time, you know, like 30 minutes late, <laughs> you know, like whatever. It's, it's, he is, it is a concern that he's raising to this person. It's framed in a certain way that's got a bit of a barb to it, but there is a playful attitude by it. And I think it's a way to um, mediate tension, probably, is what guys are doing uh, there, where the feminine style of communication tends to be a little more roundabout. Um, but same things happen. So I, I do think to some degree it's, uh, it is intentions. There are things that are just mean-spirited. and uh, But think of some of the things that Paul says. Oh, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? Right? I mean, you know how that, that book starts. I love you guys. I'm, see, I'm praying for you. And then, like, the chapter goes there. And so was he, was he loving them with that harsh speech? He was. I'm using insults because it's provocative, right? That's why. Well, that's going to, like, catch people's attention. Um, and... Uh, and I wanted to talk about 1 Kings 2011 because I thought it's helpful. And it is an insult, but I, how often have people insulted you and it really been love on accident <laughs> sometimes? So I don't know that that's the greatest. I don't, I hope, I don't want to turn NS, well, NSA <laughs> to like an insult comments. That's like really funny. Like you guys tearing each other down in Latin or something. Like... <laughs> Like, like, like Shakespeare, like, uh, I bite my thumb at you, or whatever, you're like, getting real intense. But, um, but there is a, uh, a willingness to push people to cause some pain with your words so they feel it. And I think that's what a good rebuke does. And depending on the nature of your relationship and the severity of the, of the issue, you should moderate 
your own intensity at how you say it. To people I know closely, it might be quite intense. And people that are under my direct care, it might be quite intense. Where they're not, and I don't know them, I'm going to have to moderate it so it might land. Because you don't want them to put their guard up so much that they shut down. So I don't know how helpful that is. With flattery, I'll give you a, I'll give you a story with flattery. Um, I went out with this pastor, went out for drinks, and I had been, um, I was in the PCA, believing the things I do, things can get intense when you're in the PCA, and, um, and had run into an issue with some guys that were his buds, so pastor I'm drinking with, I ran into issues with his buddies, okay, and he said, all right, what happened, and I tell him the whole story, and he's, oh, brother, that shit, oh, that was so hard for you, and I'm so sorry, is your wife Okay. At that moment, I never trusted that man again. Why, a man he barely knows, is he siding with me over his friends? It's very strange. And then I started to realize this man is a flatterer. He's a chameleon. And he's going to tell whatever he thinks. And that proved to be true. And that man ended up losing his church and other things uh, for being very deceptive in the way he went about things. And so sometimes you, you understand flattery where it's like, this is, why are you agreeing with me. I, sometimes you open up to, with people hoping they'll disagree with you, right? Hoping they'll say that's bad. And when they say it's bad, you almost want to argue with them, but you know you need that. So I think with flattery, uh, the way you determine it at one level is w what's their agenda? Is it to make you like them or are they telling you something that, that actually is helpful to your spirit? And how do you, how do you deal with it when, you know, in a pastoral situation, you know, you know, you know them well, and it's a hard word, but it's not, it's not either received in the spirit that it's given, sure. or uh, the defenses go up. What, what, what do you do at that point? Live to die another day sometimes, right? You, there's a time to back off and uh, trust that the Lord works through many means and not everything's on you. Um, when you realize something's going the wrong way, you, it's good. To, wisdom is learning to pivot. Right, like this is the wrong strategy. Um, I thought this was going to land. It's not landing, and this is not going. So when you lean on somebody, um, there's this, this young man uh, got saved in uh, the church, my first church plant years ago, and he always wanted to talk about evolution. I want to talk about evolution. Okay, we'll talk about it next time, right? So I said we'd talk about it next time for I don't know months. We never, we still, I don't think we never talked about it. This is, I'm going to be in his wedding here in a couple of days or a couple of months, and. It's been like 15 years, so I mean, you should probably talk about that. No, but, uh, but the reason I did it, I knew it was a big deal for him, and I knew he wanted to make it this sort of line, like this skirmish line, and by not engaging him there but hitting other things, I didn't lean into it. He, didn't, he wasn't able to dig his heels in because I wouldn't do it. And so sometimes with people, you, you can come at it from a different direction and being, you know, um, like me wondering, are, are the NSA kids proud? What if I talk about insults? How will it land? Right? So that's what I thought about. I wondered if that was your nature. I don't know. I'll get to know. I like, so far, we're doing good. Okay? Um, but, but having a different strategy at coming to those people, and, and there's a word in, in a right season, and sometimes the word itself is good, but the season's wrong. And, and sometimes people are just not going to receive it. And uh, that's what church discipline's for eventually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> one thing led to another. <laughs> yeah, that escalated quickly, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, would you say to, uh, let's say, guys in particular in this instance, you say the natural sort of default mode is insult or sort of teasing? Yeah, teasing. Rebuke. Yeah. Um, would you say no? You need to learn how to speak a positive word into another person's life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I, I'm convinced that um, men in particular uh, has been my area of focus. Yeah. I do think they don't get enough encouragement. But uh, once you have your own children, you realize how boys, boys are fragile in a way that girls aren't early on, you realize emotionally. Um, and they need a ton of encouragement and exhortation. And there's a real danger uh, to, uh, to wear your boys down, and that's why Scripture warns fathers about it. So, yeah, I think a good brother, it, it, doesn't ha it can be like, hey, that was great, man, and that's it. 
right? That's, and, that, and that's enough to carry guys. Guys can, uh, they can drive far on a little bit of that sort of fuel. And, and you don't want to give them too much uh, because that can inflate someone and it's not good. And they'll start to wonder, well, why are you always saying that, you know? But yeah, I do think you should learn to give it. I think they both happen at the same time. Everything, everything's messy in the beginning and early life. It's okay. It's part of it. Okay. Let me open up. Uh, uh, questions? Yes, front here. Yes. I do have a rule. Only Ellie, easy questions. It? Only easy questions. <laughs> and then the story. Uh, looking at social media in particular, uh, you see, frankly, a lot of belligerence sure. among Christians um, who use social media. How should Christians use social media um, towards the end of using the art of insulting well? <laughs> you repeat the question so the people at the back can hear. Oh, man, that's a good one. Um, so there's a lot of uh, belligerence on social media. That, so how can Christians use insults on social media in a, in a godly way? Yeah? Okay, cool. So on social media, I have learned to dial back my sarcasm and be real straight, shoot very straightforward with people, uh, remove all that. I, I think it's lost on people. I think we're a tone death. Uh, truncated people intellectually right now. And I, I think on social media, it's so easy to be misunderstood. If, if, if what you're saying depends on tone and it's in a broad audience. So let's take uh, Pastor Wilson. Um, he, he's, he likes to turn a phrase, right? Um, and, but he's writing for, uh, for his church, for people in the CRC, for people that are coming to his blog. Now, anyone can come to it, right? But that's not the intended audience. So he can, he can play around like that, and that's fine. If you're on something that's mass, like purposely mass media, and you have zero control over it, say like Twitter um, would be a good example, or, or TikTok. <laughs> or TikTok, right? Um, <clears throat> where you don't have really control where it's going, um, TikTok's actually a little different because it involves video. But something that's pure text, I would urge you to not insult anyone. I would urge you not to be sarcastic or sardonic or anything like that. To be about as straight as you can. And <clears throat> my, I have a pretty large social media following. And, and it really grew when I stopped doing that. Um, and I think it's just, it's, it makes them have to deal with what I'm saying and not my tone. Because even if they don't care about the tone, they're like, well, if you, if you, you know, it's your tone that I don't like. So if I change my tone and I put a bunch of adverbs around it, right, to weaken everything, would you agree? And no, no, I wouldn't, right? But, but why just, let's just cut them off, cut them off and not have that talk. So I just think you should avoid it where, where you can until you become a master, right? I think Doug could do it, but Doug doesn't. He's posting weird George Herbert stuff on Twitter. I don't know, it's like some... George Herbert. Uh, isn't it George Herbert he puts on Twitter? Yeah. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, so you see the decisions he's made. Uh, there's some wisdom in that. And it's dirty, and it can, uh, it can take a lot of your time. So, yeah, I don't know that you can do it. I think insults are best for friends. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to tell you. That's how it actually works. So, anyway, there's my, my shot at that. Okay. Ethan. I'm kind of wondering, uh, like as guys, and we're trying to build friendships, try to gauge, um, how can we, how can we be insulting in a loving way? <laughs> this is the greatest session ever. <laughs> Go on. How can we not? Like, we've often brought the guy that's taking it too far, and it's like they're just kind of scoffing. Yeah. So how can we do that in a way that actually blesses others? Like, oh yeah, you're making me take myself less seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, so step one is love the person, right? Absolutely, step one. And actually care about them, be invested in them and all that. that, that you have to start there. Um, bear, bear the weight, encourage them when they're down, you know, pick them up when they need a ride. It's just, you know, just invest in someone's life, right? Actually love them. So you have to do things together and to build that sort of trust. <clears throat> um, I think um, so Athanasius, <clears throat> my second son, is 
I got a caveman and a Cyprian as well. <laughs> Nonetheless, Athanasius, which is a great name because if he's in trouble, we call him Athen around the house. I don't even have to say his middle name if he's in trouble. I just go, Athanasius, right? I don't have to say Athanasius Clive. Um, I gave him the middle name Clive after C.S. Lewis. This is me rambling. Because who wants to go by Clive, right? So he's going to stick with Athanasius. Um, <clears throat> so it's a real decision I made. Um, but Athen took himself very serious, right? He got his feelings hurt really easily. So what I did with him is I hug him a lot first off. Come here, man. Love you. What's going on? You know, just do the whole hair thing. And uh, just talk to him, keep up with him, you know. Uh, he's kind of, he likes a lot of physical interaction, all that. So that, that, that's a basis in a relationship. But then um, uh, I would, like, mock him when he'd get real, <laughs> real offended. Whenever we would criticize him on something, I would definitely mock him a little bit. Like, oh, are you, you going to freak out now, son? Like, you, you, can't, you don't do anything wrong because you just get really. So he started to realize, like, that I was, no one's going to take him serious when he acts that way, right? And me mocking, teasing, whatever you want to call it, pick your category, whatever the best descriptive term there, was my way to take him down a notch and say this is not good behavior. And guys are not going to put up with dudes that are so fragile, so brittle that way. But it's part of a whole relationship. And a lot of, like, teasing and, I mean, me and some of my guy friends, this is embarrassing to admit, I guess, but, like, we'll tickle each other every once in a while, you know. <laughs> I was like, dude, dude, I'm going to punch you in your face, man. Do that again. You know, um, I saw a guy, he's not here, but he was working um, the camera for Man Rampant. And he had this little red, like, a little red hat on that you wear when you work the dock. And he had a mustache, which is a thing out here I'm learning. But um, <clears throat> so I was like, hey, so how do, you do the, how do you do the film work and work the docks at the same time? And he didn't know that. <laughs> and then I was like, so can you sing Bohemian Rhapsody? Because I'm seeing this, <laughs> this mustache here. Just real quick, you know, first line, right? But he totally rolled with it. And he liked it. And it built camaraderie because it's not real. I, I know he doesn't work the docks. And I mean, he maybe he can sing, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody, <laughs> right? <clears throat> um, he told me nothing really matters. I thought that was deep. But, um, <laughs> but he knew that I didn't despise him. That was just, it was playfulness, right? We're taking each other's measure. And, uh, and when someone comes back and teases you, right? Like, you like it. Um, so sometimes you tease people to let them know that, they, that their gravitas that they're trying to manifest, graveness, seriousness, is really self-seriousness, right? And so it's the opposite of godly levity. It's, uh, it's like a black hole that sucks everyone into it and brings everyone down to a bad place. So there's a level of emotional intelligence that we have to to develop some of these things, it's hard to turn them into step-by-step -step stuff. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Uh, right at the very back, absolutely no hope of seeing. I have a clarifying question. What do you mean taking someone's measure? Sure. So um, let me explain it through uh, guys first. Um, so. Guys that are easily offended, guys that can't operate under stress are not helpful on a mission, wherever that mission is. So in my day job, I, let's see, what can I give away here so I don't get canceled? Um, well, my day job, I do a lot of business development and uh, it can, can travel a lot, and I can work very, very long days and under very stressful um, situation closely with other men. And it can be intense, and you're not having rest, and you want to know that someone can keep their cool in those sort of intense situations. Uh, when guys are messing with each other, it's, it's kind of, it's very frustrating, but you have to learn it. So 
if you roll over and let someone beat up on you all the time, that's a bad sign too, too you know, that you can't stand your own. But if you also overreact, that's bad as well. Like, you know, like if you make, if the Freddie Mercury guy, like, um, came at me really hard and took it really personal, it would be out of step with what was happening there, right? It was playful, and he took something that was playful and made it intense. What happens when something intense happens, right? How does he react to that? Is he going to magnify that too instead of, like, knowing how to operate and read a room? And so a lot of that is taking a measure of someone is, like, how will they behave in sort of uh, certain situ situations. I th that's what guys are trying to figure out. You know, it's like guys, I, I played football, and we would tease each other a ton until we're on the field. And then it's just one team focused and going. When we got off the field, we tease each other again. But it, it was like prepping so we could, we could trust each other. So by taking someone's measure is figuring out where they're at in terms of their reactivity to other people, their humility. You know, when people make fun of you and you're humble, it doesn't, it just kind of rolls off after a while. Um, you get really good at it. And uh, um, so that's what I mean. You, uh, I'm going to ask another question. You talk about, uh, you use the term white trash. Yes. I'm not from here, so. Yeah. I know the term. But, uh, it's not I as popular be, as it used to be, but it, yeah. Um, you, you talk about low expectations. Sure. Okay. Uh, video game, that can of beer in the sofa is mm -hmm. how it yeah. goes. So someone gets saved in that context. Obviously, you hope part of the salvation is there's a dramatic transformation. There is. Not everyone is dramatically transformed True. at that point of salvation. That's right. uh, in t so, how do you go about motivating someone who has had zero motivation all their life, no encouragement from a family, maybe not even a family. Mm -hmm. you know, how, pastorally, how do you get that person off that sofa? It's, it's, okay, so they have to have, there has to be a fire for you to feed it. Okay. If there's no motivation, I don't think you can. Or at least I wouldn't spend too much time. Right, I try, like try. But you can definitely feed a fire. Um, so what happened with me is I didn't know how big the world was, and I didn't know how many possibilities there, there were and what could be accomplished. And, uh, and I've, I've done a lot of kind of crazy things, actually, um, that I never imagined I would uh, do. And uh, it happened by men expecting more of me, but at the right level. Like, and so a goal is something that's achievable with difficulty. Right, if you can't achieve it, it's not really a goal. And if you can do it really easy, well, you kind of do it anyway. So a good goal has to be difficult and achievable. So these guys, they were always pushing me just a little bit, stretching me. So it's like lifting weights, like anything else. Like if you come under 400 pounds when you first start benching, like you're gonna die, okay? Um, and you add weights and you push it. And that I had mentors in my life that would say, so what's your Bible plan? I was like, oh, I don't have one. Well, you need to have a Bible plan. And I'm like, oh, well, what? tell me what to do. And they said, read a chapter of the Bible every day and a chapter of Proverbs every day and repeat Proverbs every month. So that's what I started doing. And that was a lot because I didn't ever do anything like that before, but I haven't stopped, you know, and I added to it more and more. And so I think with start stretching them and always pushing them just a little bit. And when they, when they accomplish it, even if it's not perfect, like, that's great, man. This is good. This is, you're moving in the right direction. You're going you're gonna to get further. And I always push them. And I, I, can remember, I can remember my wrestling coach um, where I, I went out and just uh, I had never wrestled before. They're the worst people to wrestle are people who have never wrestled before. And they flip around like a fish. It's all crazy. They don't know what they're doing. They throw their elbows. And you get hit in your face. And that is exactly what I did because <laughs> I, I just was trying to – pure aggression to win. Um, and I did, and I got stuck. I got pinned by a guy that uh, was finished third in state. And he shook my, head, uh, shook my hand and said I did a good job. And I came off the mat, and Donnie Stonefield, uh, Donnie said, Foster, you can wrestle for me if you wrestle like that every time. I never wrestled before. But it was just that he saw that I gave it all. And, and so I got better 
and better and better, and was the team captain of my wrestling team. But it was just, um, he'd, I'd been through practice. He'd never said anything like that to me before. But when, he, when he, he put me out there, he took out the varsity guy and stuck me in there because I think he thought the varsity guy would get beat, and he probably would have. And here's this, like, new guy, sacrificial lamb, but give him a shot, you know? So, and then I show up and try, and he gave me the opportunity. I think that's one way with guys that aren't motivated. You, you got to stretch them. You know, in my church, I delegate a lot. I have to. Our churches went from zero to about 210 people in 11 months. Um, so it's, a lot's happening really quick. When I delegate to, it's usually relatively big things. I, I'll say, here's what we need to do. Here's when, how I would like it to be accomplished in a big picture way. Can you put together a plan and just let me see what you're doing? And then I get out of the way. And so far, everyone's doing exactly what they said they did. And I think part of it is when you, at, when you tell men, you give them something great to do. A lot of men, a lot of people, not just men, will aspire to that. And when we ask so little from people, you get little. If you want a lot, you ask a lot. So I think the problem is with the, the kid on the couch is no one ever told them they could do great things. No one said, you can wrestle for me, right? I want you. Let's do this. So I think that's where we start. We feed that fire. We expect a lot out of them. And when they make mistakes, that's fine. If the mistake is a mistake of um, just lack of precision but not of effort um, and initiative, we don't, want the, we don't want to burn them over it. Okay. Another question? Yes. Here. Yeah. So when we were younger, my brothers and I would call each other names, you know, wrestle, do, do the boy things. <laughs> so as a parent, how would you sort of regulate that, that name calling false or of Like calling your given Christian names or? <laughs> no. I, so he's asking... Um, how would you regulate? Um, in other words, they would call each other names um, when they're little and as they're growing up. And how do you, as a parent, uh, decide when it's gone too far? With so many things, it's discernment, right? And I've had to sit down with my oldest son and say, okay, we're pushing Athen a little too hard here. And you got to stop saying those things to him. Like, this, you're not being playful at this point. You're just being mean, and you're just aggravating them because you're aggravated with them. And so it's coming, it's coming from a, a mean place, man. And this is not kind. This is not gentle. So gentle, one way to think about gentle is throwing a sack of potatoes in the back of your trunk is gentle. It's a sack of potatoes. They're going to be all right, right? Throwing a lamp into your trunk is not gentle, right? So gentle is, is contextual at some level. Um, so when you're teasing each other and it's out of playfulness, you mean no harm or whatever, uh, that can still be gentle. But there's a place where someone's upset or angry or down or whatever, where then it, it really is out of a place to frustrate. You're not being gentle. And the thing that I think that's so hard is that the Bible doesn't give us instructions. <laughs> It gives us principles and truth that we have to learn to apply and develop discernment and judgment. How many drinks is too much? My wife is a little thing, right? So much less than me. Um, she's like my leg. I, um, <clears throat> I, uh... That's not so small. <laughs> Just putting it into practice. I'm a quick learner. The new, new St. Andrews. <laughs> She's like my calf. Okay. Okay. Um, but uh, <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, I can drink relative to our size. We drink the same. Right? It's contextual. And you're just going to have to learn to be wise. But th that's the thing. Like, we're scared to, ri like, I've said things that have offended people, and I've really regretted it. And I learn. And, you, and there's a, I think, what, what I hate about what's happened to the millennials and down is how risk adverse you are. I don't know how it happened. I know partly it's my fault. I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and we were told 
that there are guys in dark vans with candies and puppies always trying to kidnap us, right? Like, seriously, we were, we were taught this all the time. Uh, there was uh, Unsolved Mysteries and Rescue 911. I remember Rescue 911, there was this one episode, William Shatner uh, would host it. This kid ran through like a glass window and it cut his arm all up. And I was like petrified of glass windows. I was gonna do that for years, like that's a normal thing. But you know, in a given year, about 2,000 kids are kidnapped and about maybe 100, 150 of them are kidnapped by non-family members, right? There's a lot of people. That's nothing. It's not, it rarely happens, okay? And yet, I, I was raised to get, uh, where I started to fear those things as I grew into a parent. I used to go jump off train bridges and be away all day, and when my son doesn't answer his cell phone after a couple hours, I'm like freaking out. You know, you okay? What's going on? Oh yeah, I just left it on silent. You know, I was doing my work, like, oh, okay. But, so, I do think there's a risk aversion that those of us that want to be helicopter parents still kind of are that way, and we're trying to fight against it, and it's kind of uh, trickled down into y'all where you won't take risk, but you have to. You have to risk failure if you're going to grow. You have to, like, dare to do great things. You have to take risks in the things you say, um, I once was out with this guy. He's married now. We're at the Hofbrau house, in, um, not in Germany, but in Cincinnati. It's like the real one. And there was this, uh, uh, this, pretty, this pretty waitress, right, like way out of his league. And he asked her out. And we all are just like laughing, like, like trying not to explode. And she totally said no. She said, oh, that's sweet. And as a guy, you're like, sweet. <laughs> I don't want to be sweet, you know. It's not the category. If a girl says, oh, you're like such a good friend. Oh, look, guys, that's probably not going very far there. Just let me tell you. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you know what? It, it, when finally the right girl came, he went after her, and they're married, and he's, they've got a business and a bunch of kids, and they make their own clothes, like all this like frontier stuff or whatever. Or not frontier, I don't know. Like, it's, like, it's not LARPing, I, I guess. Um, <laughs> but, but they love it, and they're happy. And she's, she's beautiful, and they're happy. And that's because he started taking those risks early on, and he matured into someone that would do that. I was, so has, what does this have to do with the, the original question back here? Um, I do think, as parents, you, you learn to let things go for a while, right? You don't intervene on everything. You learn to let them go, calm down, okay? And there is a time to intervene, and that's usually when it's getting ready to come to blows, which, did it ever come to blows? <laughs> Pretty hard blow if you don't remember, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. You, you do intervene at a certain point. And I've had to do, I was, I was downstairs one night. Our master bedroom's downstairs and the boys are upstairs. And I just heard like, and I was like, what in the world is going on upstairs? And I went up there and my two oldest boys were like in a, they're like fighting. Like not, I guess more like wrestling. They, has, they haven't really started hitting each other yet. I was like, what is going on? They're both like, I don't know, I'm just mad. <laughs> And um, so I broke them up and brought one into one room and talked to them and figured out how this all had happened and talked to the other one, and, and then they all worked it out. You know, that's life. Life is it's messy. That's why, that's why being around, uh, spending time with mentors here, the pastors, the, the, old, the Titus two women, the godly men, and, and watching and seeing what they do is so important. Because questions like this, they're very difficult to answer with bold letter text, right? Something you'd see in a textbook. Um, these are things that are caught more than they are even taught. And so the wealth you have here is not just your curriculum. The wealth you have is in the quality of your teachers and pastors. The fact that they love their wife and their children. And that's like doubled down on that. Don't get so lost in your studies that you're not taking advantage of these older, godly people. It's, it's the ultimate cheat code to life, learning from those people. Uh, we are out of time. Michael, thank you very much. Please thank say you. thank you to Michael.